and it's uh, inspired by the uh, inspired by uh, Palm Wonderful. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Supreme Court's decision, um, uh, Palm Wonderful uh, sued Coca-Cola for putting, putting out a product uh, labeled pomegranate blueberry juice um, that was 99.4% apple and grape juice. Um, hardly any pomegranate or blueberry juice in the product at all. Uh, and uh, Coca-Cola's defense was that uh, they were allowed to call it uh, pomegranate blueberry juice uh, under FDA labeling re regulations, which basically say if there is any tiny portion of that juice um, in the product, um, you can put that uh, on the label. Uh, and the label also had pictures of all these wonderful fruits other than apples and grapes. Um, but the holding uh, was that uh, FDA label compliance with FDA labeling uh, regulations does not immunize a product name or label from a Lanham Act false advertising claim. So no safe harbor just because you comply with the FDA uh, requirements. Um, with this safe harbor gone now, I think this opens the door to the, the larger question of what makes a product name or label of false, misleading, or deceptive uh, for purposes of either the Lanham Act's false advertising provisions or um, state laws uh, addressing uh, false advertising. Uh, and without the safe harbor, I think there is the, the potential for a flood of litigation, and some of that litigation has already started uh, to occur. Um, there, were, there was a question, uh, the basic question in, in Palm Wonderful was, does uh, the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act uh, preempt um, state laws uh, that impose, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it does, it, does, it, does it preempt uh, the Lanham Act uh, false advertising provision? And um, here's the basic rundown on what the FDCA uh, preempts. It does expressly preempt uh, state laws that impose uh, labeling requirements for food, drugs, or cosmetics that are not identical uh, to FDA uh, requirements but it doesn't preempt state laws that incorporate those FDA standards. So California actually has a private right of action for consumers, uh, which apparently um, is not preempted by the FDCA, uh, because it exactly tracks the uh, FDA uh, standards. So you can have consumer, you do have consumer class actions uh, for false advertising in California uh, that are apparently not preempted uh, by the FDCA. Uh, the FDCA does not expressly uh, preempt uh, state laws that are similar to the Lanham Act's general false advertising provisions. So state laws that are worded as um, uh, creating a, a right of action for false or deceptive um, advertising are not expressly preempted. Um, and, and courts thus far have found that there's no preemption of those general uh, false advertising uh, laws. Uh, but uh, potentially, a remedy in such a case could involve an injunction that could potentially impose requirements that are not consistent with FDA regs. So that could potentially create a um, preemption problem. Uh, but as things stand right now, um, federal uh, false advertising claims are not preempted. Um, state laws that um, mimic the FDA are, uh, requirements are not preempted. And general state false advertising uh, claims are not preempted. Um, so, um, what is the potential for uh, people bringing uh, actions um, uh, alleging false advertising based on the name of a product or other content that appears prominently on the label? Um, well, uh, under Lexmark, uh, we now know Lanham Act claims uh, can be brought by parties alleging commercial injuries. So, of course, that's going to include competitors, um, potentially other uh, parties as well. Um, it's possible, though, that there might not be too much increase in litigation because um, competitors, anyway, uh, do face the glass houses problem uh, because uh, if they go after Coca-Cola for um, deceptive labeling, uh, there might be something on the plaintiff's own label that is vulnerable to challenges as well, so they might have to think rather seriously before they uh, open this can of worms. Uh, so even uh, Palm Wonderful's um, uh, label that says pomegranate blueberry juice, uh, exactly was, what does that imply about the contents uh, of uh, the juice? And what if they reversed it and said blueberry pomegranate? Does that imply something different 
Does that imply that blueberry predominates over pomegranate? Uh, do these imply that it's 50-50? Um, I think you might have to individually poll every consumer because you might get a very different reaction to what that particular phrase um, uh, conveys in terms of some inference about the content of the product. Um, now claims under state false advertising or deceptive trade practices laws um, or state laws that mimic the FDA standards, um, these typically give uh, standing to consumers um, and as I said, the preemption question is somewhat unsettled in this area, uh, but you don't have the glass houses problem um, because consumers don't worry about getting sued for their own representations. And uh, as a result, you do see class actions in California and Florida that have uh, these uh, statutes. Um, and so you see consumers bringing class actions um, against um, uh, makers of products that have uh, some misleading content on the labels. Um, and there's also a, an older case uh, of basically applying the same analysis to USDA approved labels saying that that also is not a safe harbor from Lanham Act false advertising claims. Um, how is this related to the standards for trademark registration? <coughs> well, deceptive marks, we're told, can't be registered. Right, so if they are uh, false and plausible and they would materially influence the purchasing decision, they supposedly can't be registered. But deceptively misdescriptive ones can. Geographic marks, we're going to take those out of the picture right now because the Federal Circuit messed that all up. Um, but other, other kinds of, of uh, marks that are deceptively misdescriptive can be registered if they have secondary meaning. And so there are a, a fair number of, of those. Um, the, uh, but the PTO and the courts might have different perceptions of what is deceptive uh, for registration purposes versus what is deceptive in the context of a false advertising claim, where you're looking at the entire context in which the uh, uh, trademark appears, whereas with uh, registration, you're basically looking at the nature, the general nature of the product and, uh, and the, the mark itself. and uh, something might not appear to be deceptive in that context, but might prove to be deceptive in the context in which the consumer actually experiences the product or its advertising. Um, so what is non-deceptive in the abstract may be deceptive in context due to the appearance of the label, or the content of advertising. An example is a case involving these Breath Assure tablets. For breath freshening tablets, that in fact did not freshen breath. <laughs> the defendant even conceded this in the litigation. Um, and the Third Circuit held that the name was deceptive, especially in light of all the advertising that had said these products could freshen the breath. Even though the advertising had been discontinued, the Third Circuit emphasized that there was a residual effect of that advertising, and this fortified their decision that. Um, the words breath assure were, um, were deceptive in the context of false uh, advertising. Um, the court didn't really come out and say that they would have reached the same conclusion in the absence of the residual effect of that advertising, so um, it, it's not entirely clear whether they would have um, ruled that breath assure was deceptive just because it implies something that the product doesn't do. The court said it was literally false, so it didn't require any proof of what consumers actually believed, which is consistent with general false advertising uh, doctrine. Um, this mark had been registered. PTO did, had allowed this mark to be registered. Uh, apparently, they didn't require any evidence of whether the product actually did assure anything about your breath. They didn't think it was deceptive, apparently, or they missed the issue. Um, uh, but subsequently, the mark was canceled, except for chewing gum. It's still on there for chewing gum. And uh, does the chewing gum freshen your breath in, in, to a greater degree than the tablets? I have no idea. Uh, but it's still on there for chewing gum. And the same defendant also re registered Health Assure for dietary uh, supplements. That is still on the register. And that's probably a harder one to say is deceptive, because while uh, Breath Assure implies something specific about your breath, Health is so broad, right? Health is so broad that perhaps just thinking that the product makes you healthier, maybe it does have the effect of making you healthy. So a, a general term like health assure is awfully hard to prove deceptive 
uh, or not, but it's possible that in a false advertising context, a court might find that this registered trademark, as applied on a, on a particular label, uh, is deceptive enough to uh, constitute false advertising. Another claim involved a Melanta product, uh, Melanta Nighttime Strength. Um, the uh, court said that the, uh, the name did constitute false uh, advertising in that it was deceptive. There was a consumer survey saying 30% uh, of people believe the product provided all night heartburn relief, which it did not. Uh, in the absence of the survey, um, would the court have reached the same conclusion? Um, I don't know. Um, it's, if it was conceded that it did not provide all night heartburn relief, could you say that on its face, this language implies to a consumer that they will have all night uh, relief? I don't know. If we polled individual consumers, we might get different, different answers. I'm not sure that we'd get uniformity. Uh, this mark was never registered, so it was never I tested. litigated this case. Did they you? They actually did get uniform answers. They thought it lasted all night. They did. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. All right. I mean, there is a survey. Okay. So yeah. Well, yeah. 30% of the respondents <laughs> believed it provided all night, and that seemed to be obviously very, very persuasive. Um, uh, okay. Well, thank you. Um, uh, Gerber had, puts out a product called Fruit Juice uh, Snacks. Uh, that was held to be a deceptive label. It, the mark had never been registered, um, and it may very well be that companies uh, know not to even try registering uh, these marks, um, and uh, perhaps they thought they'd be safe from a false advertising claim, but uh, after Tom Wonderful, they're probably not. The packaging on these Fruit Juice Snacks um, uh, showed all these wonderful fruits, but the only juice in it was white grape juice from concentrate. The label said nutritious, said it was made with real fruit juice and other all natural ingredients, which I think is different from saying uh, all natural ingredients. Agreement, uh, ingredients. It, it's implying that there are some all natural ingredients in, there, ingredients in there, but there might be some other things that are like totally artificial. So it's very tricky wording. Uh, the major ingredients, of course, were corn syrup and water, right? So um, the Ninth Circuit said this was likely to deceive a reasonable consumer, although nutritious, the word nutritious might be puffery because it's hard to measure that concretely, like the word health in health assure. How do you concretely measure health? How do you concretely measure what nutrition is? So a lot of these terms, uh, again, I think if we polled different consumers, we might not get uniform answers. Uh, and they were smart, I think, never to have tried to register that mark. Um, held not to be deceptive, Fruit Loops. Okay. Um, is it because of how it's spelled? Uh, or is it because nobody um, seeing the packaging of the product would believe there was actual fruit in there? I don't think it had pictures, I don't think the cereal box had pictures of fruit on it. Uh, crunch Berries. Um, had close-up pictures of these so-called berries, which were obviously just balls of cereal. Uh, and the holdings in these cases said no reasonable consumer seeing the product packaging would believe these cereals contained real fruit. But there was no survey evidence, so the court was just imagining the reasonable consumer uh, and saying that we don't think uh, any reasonable consumer would believe that there was fruit in these products. If they'd spelled Fruit Loops differently, if it's F-R-U-I-T, would the court reach a different conclusion? Do the two letters make that much difference? I don't know. Um, names and labels versus um, more traditional advertising methods like commercials or print ads, um, the false advertising analysis might have to be a little bit different um, because names and labels are such shorthands Right? And they're really only implying something most of the time. They're usually not making declarative uh, statements. They'll put a word here or a picture here, and they allow the consumer to draw their own conclusion. And we'll maybe tend to fill in what we want to believe, perhaps, or what we um, are, are sort of pre-trained uh, to believe based on our personal experience um, of similar products or our own different degrees of skepticism. Uh, so, mu so much of it is implied rather than expressly stated that I think our own individual mindsets can alter our perception of what these shorthands really mean. Um, and if the product name alone versus the product name as it appears on the packaging can involve different inferences as well. Fruit Loops accompanied by lots of pictures of fruit might imply something very different from just the name Fruit Loops itself. Um, also, I think an important point uh, that I think 
uh, really bolsters the Supreme Court's decision of how wonderful is that terms may very well have defined meanings under the FDA regulations, but which, how many consumers know what those meanings are, right? Or even know that the terms have defined meanings. So the FDA definitions are really kind of irrelevant to consumer perceptions. Um, are these misleading? Pomegranate blueberry juice. If that's what you call your juice product, what does that imply to the consumer? Does the consumer believe that it's 50-50? Half pomegranate, half blueberry. Is that what that implies? Or do, um, the actual percentage was 85-15. Okay, so much more pomegranate than blueberry. Uh, what if it was the other way around? It was only 15% uh, pomegranate. Would this be misleading? Because pomegranate coming first, does that imply there's more pomegranate juice than blueberry? Does it imply that they're equal? Uh, and what if it has 10% corn syrup in it? Or 5% corn syrup? Okay, can you still call it pomegranate blueberry juice when it's not 100% uh, juice? Okay, um, what do consumers think when they see that term? Again, I think and in many cases it depends on individual consumers. Um, and uh, if, you, uh, if you do a survey, you might get really scattered results, or you might be able to skew your survey, depending on how you ask the questions. Um, uh, juicy fruit is a registered trademark. We all know what juicy fruit refers to, don't we? Does it have any fruit in it? I don't think so. It has no fruit at all. It's not the least bit healthy. Um, to the extent it's juicy, it's just because it's your own saliva. There's no juice in it. Okay, certainly no fruit. Does it make a difference how you spell Fruit Loops? That's a registered trademark. Um, uh, would it be more deceptive if it was spelled with a UI? How about lime jello? Does anybody think there's real lime in lime jello? Here's juicy fruit. Look at the packaging. Okay, there's no disclaimers on the front. It doesn't say anything about artificial flavors or anything. It just says juicy fruit. Okay, I think we're not confused by it because it has secondary meaning at this point. We all know it's juicy fruit gum. It says gum on it. We all know that term. But, you know, if we were encountering it for the first time without the secondary meaning, that's pretty darn deceptive. Right. So um, the existence of the secondary meaning certainly helps prevent this from being false advertising, I think. Um, uh, but uh, you know, if this mark were something newly being used and hadn't yet acquired secondary meaning, it seems to me to be very problematic, with uh, nothing on the front to um, tell you that there's no uh, juice and no fruit. Uh, here's lime jello. Uh, not, it's a little fuzzy. Right? Large picture of slices of lime. Mmm, lime, right? Naturally fat free. Okay, the word natural. That makes your mind think in terms of real fruit, right? Down in the lower right hand corner, it's fuzzy. It says artificial flavor. Does that mean it's entirely artificial or they've added just a little artificial flavor, but most of it is really lime? Okay, um, one could argue that that's deceptive. I think only because of our experience with Jell-O do we know that it's just a whole bunch of artificial stuff, right? Um, but on the face of it, um, this looks pretty deceptive. Uh, so what do consumers think these terms mean? Okay, here's a list of terms that people look for, but um, we don't really know what they mean when they're on the label. We would have to flip it over and look at all of the ingredients, and then sometimes even the ingredients are a little misleading. What, what does organic or natural or free-range mean? Low-fat, fat-free, low-carb, light. Um, if you actually look at um, the federal uh, rules on some of these terms, it, it, you can call the product zero trans fat, but it can still have up to, uh, up to 0.5 milligrams of trans fat per serving. Same with cholesterol-free, low cholesterol, zero calories, sugar-free. Um, they're not really zero. Uh, healthy and nutritious, puffery words, who knows what those mean. Um, is there a difference between calling something juice or a juice drink or a juice beverage? Are those weaker claims than calling it juice? Okay. And there's one product um, that implied that it was healthy and all natural for you. Um, and if you actually looked at the ingredients list, it, it listed cane juice as an ingredient. Okay. What is cane juice? It is sugar water, right? <laughs> but they came up with a term that makes it sound like juice. Um, so there's all kinds of manipulations that are going on. Um, in, in assessing claims against uh, product names or labels, uh, courts don't always require survey evidence. And sometimes they have even uh, ignored survey evidence that was purveyed. 
Um, if they think in their own uh, minds, based on their own mindset and experience, that a reasonable, that they know what a reasonable consumer would infer from a name or a label or the context uh, in which the name or label uh, appears. So courts are willing to substitute their own judgment when they think it's a, a clear-cut uh, case. Um, but I do think there's going to be cases where every consumer will bring a slightly different cognitive process to drawing inferences from these uh, names or labels. Uh, unlike the likelihood of confusion analysis, where the courts also, to some degree, substitute their own judgment, um, if there is no evidence of actual confusion, uh, unlike that context, in false advertising, courts have not really articulated um, a set of guidelines or factors that can uh, really um, uh, enable them to uh, evaluate uh, claims on a case-by-case on case, uh, basis. They seem to do a more gut level, I know it when I see it uh, type response, at least in, in many situations. Um, so um, uh, it, we are likely to see a lot more litigation in this area. Um, are there ways to achieve greater clarity um, for, for what the standards ought to be and perhaps cut down on the litigation and perhaps promote clearer labeling or honest labeling? Um, maybe. Um, maybe uh, Congress can um, provide strict, some stricter guidance for the FDA uh, and the USDA, or perhaps those agencies can tighten up their regulations. Perhaps courts can develop um, a, a better set of guidelines for letting us uh, know uh, what the test is for whether, um, for, for how a consumer is likely to perceive uh, a, a product name or label. And this is different from the test of whether it's false, literally, or false by implication. Right. This is really a test of what does the label mean? What does the word mean? What does the picture mean to consumers? Right. So it's a different question. Um, and to the extent that right now things are uncertain, maybe this uncertainty is actually good for consumers uh, because those um, companies that are worried about false advertising claims, perhaps they will um, take a closer look at exactly what they're putting on their packages and perhaps they will uh, be a little more candid. All right, so I'm, I'm out of time. I hope maybe if you have questions, we'll see you after Luther at lunch. Thank you. Thank you.